Thank you for joining us for this live Q&A about Moya Moya. I'm Rabbi Talk, one of the cerebrovascular neurosurgeons at Mayo Clinic campus in Florida. And I'm James Meschia, chair of the Department of Neurology. Uh, we'll start by discussing some of the questions uh, commonly asked about Moya Moya disease, and we're happy to answer your questions, so please post, post them in the comments. So, uh, James, let's start with the first question. What are the symptoms of Moya Moya? How do patients come to you uh, and you know they have Moya Moya? Well, I think, you know, the, the main, some of the very common symptoms uh, basically fall into two categories. One is headaches, typically migraine-like headaches, uh, throbbing, intermittent headaches, uh, often debilitating, often triggering imaging studies uh, that then uh, lead to findings that are then pursued for a diagnosis. Um, the other major category would be TIA or strokes or transient neurologic deficits that look stroke-like, so weakness of one side of the face, slurring of the speech, maybe arm leg weakness, maybe difficulty understanding speech or communicating with others, what we call aphasia. Those sorts of stroke-like symptoms are definitely part of what you can see with Moya Moya. Great. So the second question, how is diagnosed, how, is di how you make this diagnosis? Um, I'll make it simple, basically. The, the confirmation test for Moya Moya is usually an angiogram. That's the best test to look at vessels in the brain. And uh, with a diagnostic angiogram that's good quality, most of the time I'm comfortable saying this patient has Moya Moya or he doesn't have it. Sometimes we see some findings suggestive of it on MRI or CAT scan showing multiple strokes on MRI, but none of those tests is pathognomonic. Uh, anything you would like to uh, add? Yeah, to I, think, I think the interesting thing with the diagnostic testing is I, I agree 100% with Dr. Talk that... Uh, conventional cerebral angiography with a catheter uh, inserted through an artery in the leg uh, up to the head uh, with standard kind of x-ray cameras like you do when uh, people are going in for a coronary stent uh, is definitely the gold standard. The issue is how do you go from having symptoms to ultimately being in the cath lab for definitive diagnosis. And typically, there's an intervening image of the head, for example, a CT scan or an MRI. And then the issue comes up after you see certain abnormalities that suggest ischemia or decreased blood flow in certain areas of the brain. How do you decide to pursue vessel imaging? Often on the way to the cath lab, uh, there'll be non-invasive imaging studies done of the, uh, the carotid arteries in the neck and uh, the carotid circulation in the head uh, with either CT angiography, known as CTA, or MR angiography, also called MRA. And those can give uh, good clues to Moya Moya, give you a highly suspicious diagnosis, although... Um, uh, although definitive testing, I think, is conventional angiography. Absolutely. There's no blood test, though, that you can diagnose Moya Moya or, or you know, so it's mostly uh, vascular imaging. Um, next question will take, what are the risk factors for Moya Moya? Um, here I would like to turn the attention to two types of Moya Moya. You have the Moya Moya syndrome and you have the Moya Moya disease. Moya Moya disease is known to be associated with other conditions, uh, some uh, predisposition uh, is uh, given to some patients from other disease that makes them prone to develop Moya Moya. So you have the Moya Moya disease, which is typically bilateral disease affecting both sides of the brain, both carotids. The Moya Moya syndrome is a reactive. So risk factors, for example, we see this uh, syndrome in patients who have radiation, for example. We see it more often with people who have um, uh, sickle cell disease because those sickle cells cause damage to the vessels and the damage can cause blockage of those vessels so they have reactive uh, hyperformation or, or hypervascularity mimicking Moya Moya. We see it in thyrotoxicosis, people with th chronic thyroid disease. We see it with many other conditions. So in terms of risk factors, do you consider smoking and other traditional vascular disease as risk factors here, James? I would say that uh, classically this is not an atherosclerotic condition, so, so hypertension, diabetes, smoking, obesity, sleep apnea, those sorts of things 
that we come to associate with risk of stroke and also atherosclerosis of the heart vessels or the head vessels um, is, are not necessarily risk factors for moya moya per se. However, we still emphasize the importance of controlling those vascular risk, risk factors because as uh, Dr. Talk may allude to later on, uh, the body reacts to uh, progressive closing off of large arteries coming in through the skull base by forming collaterals around the surface of the brain. And those arteries are not immune to atherosclerosis. So it's very important to preserve the vessels that remain open and avoid atherosclerosis. So probably not risk factors for moya moya per se, but they remain risk factors for stroke, which is a major complication of moya moya, hypertension, diabetes, smoking, etc. Great. So if you're just joining uh, this live Q&A about moya moya, please your, uh, leave your questions in the comments section. So let's go to the next question. Um, does it lead to other neurologic or vascular disease or conditions? So does moya moya lead to something else? Well, of course. Uh, you know, if you think about this occlusion, when the primary vessel is blocked, the brain kind of reacts and tries to create an alternative pathway. So we have the, what we call the moya moya collaterals. Those vessels are altered vessels. So it means they're stressed out to more blood supply that they need to provide. And that vessel is not naturally engineered mm -hmm. to handle this pressure. So definitely those vessels are more predisposed to form aneurysms. In adult or in children, we have two presentations of moya moya. One of them is the hemorrhagic from fragile vessels. So those vessels, when they get exposed to high pressure, they become weak, they can develop microaneurysms, and those microaneurysms can bleed and lead to a completely different presentation, which typically is the ischemic disease versus the hemorrhagic presentation in patients. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the changes in those vessels can lead to changes uh, uh, weakness and can lead to aneurysms and the bleeding in addition to the ischemic presentations. Anything you would like to add, James, about this question? Well, I think uh, as with any process that involves uh, decreased blood flow and the risk of hemorrhage or, or infarct um, to the brain, you could have secondary complication of seizures. So yeah, that's, a great, uh, that, yeah, that's another thing to consider, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I have seen few patients labeled as moya moya, and they end up being, uh, you know, a condition of vasculitis or a disease that progresses. And the literature does mention, you know, if you think about it, moya moya is isolated disease of brain vessels. There's some association with, for example, renal artery stenosis, 8%, for example, in other conditions. But I don't think those entities are clear, and I suspect there is some overlap between many, many entities. A second question, we have a question from Mayo Clinic Connect. Uh, it says, my husband was diagnosed with moya moya a few days ago. Is it a hereditary disease? We have a child together. Also, is the recovery from the surgery fairly easy? What should we expect after surgery? So how about, I'll take a few of them. And uh, the surgical questions here, uh, the, 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 the father diagnosed, is it a hereditary disease? I don't look at it as a hereditary disease because if you think about hereditary disease, they, 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 you have autosomal dominant or recessive. The incidence for family uh, in the United States for a, uh, a you know, first descendant is around 6%. If you go to Japanese population, that goes up to 7, uh, up to 11, 12%. And that still does not I don't consider it as a familiar disease. I don't know what you think about it this way. Yeah, I think the issue is absolute versus relative risk. So, for example, the risk of um, of a child of someone with moya moya having uh, moya moya uh, himself is is uh, very low from an absolute perspective, although it's much much higher than the general population. So there is some hereditary influence on disease, but it's not the sole factor. Okay, I, I completely agree. The, the second is, uh, it says, uh, recovery from surgery fairly easy. And what should you expect after surgery? So um, there is two scenarios here. The symptomatic moya moya patient with a new stroke, basically with a deficit from the stroke, which is gonna slow down recovery. So, but if we isolate surgical uh, treatment for moya moya with a bypass. There's two ways to uh, 
to do it. There's many other ways, but the standard two classic ways are the direct bypass and indirect bypass. Both of them involve skin incision, uh, bone flap removal, and exposure of the vessels on the surface of the brain. And we take a vessel from the skin, superficial temporal artery, and we make that vessel uh, supply the brain vessels, like a bypass for the heart, so we bypass with this vessel. So the indirect uh, form is we use tissue, the dura, muscle, we use a, a, an STA or, or a vessel cuff or soft tissue around it to put it on the brain. So the indirect connections, they form over time and they start supplying the brain. So surgery, when we talk about craniotomy in general, it's a hospitalization of uh, a surgery takes three, five hours. It depends how complex it is. Patients are expected to be on aspirin before um, in the ICU for one night. Uh, getting a CAT scan, making sure there is no bleed, and in the hospital for two or three days on average, if there is no uh, predisposure or, or you know high risk uh, stroke from before, where people need to go to rehab and placement takes time. Most people after craniotomy report being tired. That's the most common complaint after surgery, and that takes four to six weeks before people feel they're back up to speed. Uh, in particular, for moya moya, the, we, you know, we have to cut through the muscle, the temporalis muscle, and that's the muscle we use for chewing and eating, and opening the jaw is going to be painful uh, for a period of time, which takes a few weeks. Um, so the next question is, how common is moya moya disease? Um, well, it's well below 1%. It's more like uh, below 1 in 1,000. Um, the It depends a lot on uh, sort of the country of origin. So the, the population prevalence is much higher in Japan. This is well known. In fact, all of the early studies of Moya Moya basically come out of Japan. Much of what we know about the effectiveness of surgery comes out of Japan. Even the term Moya Moya is a Japanese phrase for puff of smoke describing what we see on the angiogram. There's clearly a a hot spot or a high prevalence area in uh, Japan. Uh, it's much less common in the United States or, or Europe, um, but it remains even in Japan as a very uncommon condition. Uh, in other words, it's an orphan disease, basically. Essentially. It's rare, basically. Yeah. Uh, another question from Mayo Clinic Connect. Are these studies to back up that Graves disease when active or hyperthyroidism when in a hyperstate can cause moya moya progression? Um, well, that's a... Uh, so the problem here is we have a disease that's rare enough and then a very rare cause causing a rare disease. So, you know, fortunately this is not hypertension or diabetes where we have thousands of patients, but in my experience I have seen several patients with Graves' disease or hyperthyroidism or thyrotoxicosis where you know, their thyroid hormones are off the roof, and you know, that condition does stress the body, and there is a, an injury, ongoing injury to the vessels. And I have seen those people stabilizing their disease or even their disease getting better after we take care of their hyperthyroidism. So uh, I would not, uh, I'm not aware of uh, studies listing patients, but, you know, in, in any, uh, any center has taken care of a lot of those patients. We definitely encourage taking care of the underlying condition because that is sometimes a reactive uh, uh, change to the vessel uh, induced by this disease. So hopefully you can suppress this and live with what you can uh, in terms of things that you can change. So this is a modifiable risk factor, Graves' disease. So we definitely suggest that we treat and very aggressively and those patients should be followed by an endocrinology specialist uh, all over uh, their, uh, you know, hormone levels. I don't know if you have anything to add, James, about it. No, I, I agree. The good news is that um, there's no reason to think that um, treatment, uh, you know, the standard treatments for Graves uh, and hyperthyroidism would be any less effective in people with Moya Moya. Absolutely. So we have another question from Mayo Clinic Connect. It says, my son is two years old. He had a stroke a month ago. Uh, we found out he has Moya Moya syndrome, 
He has had surgery on one side of his brain so far. He has tested positive for lupus anticoagulant and had to be retested to rule out false positive with having lupus anticoagulant affect his next surgery. Um, how do you look at it from the medical perspective? Uh, well, this is a complex question, certainly. I guess from my perspective, first of all, I'd, uh, I'd need to know, I guess, I'd, I'd be interested in knowing how well he did from surgery on one side of his brain because obviously that would have uh, bearing on how, how I might consider risk of pursuing surgery on the other side or additional surgery. So I don't mean to interrupt, James, but, uh, you know, looking at lupus anticoagulant, you know, uh, you know, there's many disorders of the blood that cause occlusion. I mean, we know the sickle cells, mm -hmm. the, the red cells damage the vessel wall. Mm -hmm. How do you look at patients with sickle cells, and what is the correlation you think that can cause, you know, we know sickle cells is a risk factor for stroke. Sure. But what is it, how is it implicated in, in Moya Moya patients? How you look sickle at Sickle cell? Yeah. Uh, well, sickle well, cell. Well, not sickle cells, uh, but lupus. lupus, lupus. And well, I think that, so, so the thought uh, about the mechanism of, uh, of stroke in patients with, um, with Moya Moya is that some are related to hypoperfusion, meaning that there's decreased blood flow um, below a certain threshold that the uh, brain tissue can no longer... Uh, remain viable. And then there's the other type of stroke related to thrombosis, that is a blood clot within the vessels or embolism from, from one artery to another. So, so, so essentially it's small blood vessels shutting down yes. and people reacting, yeah. developing more and more Absolutely. collateral. So, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, how, you know, besides what you treat for lupus, like making the blood thin or something, is mm -hmm. there something you can use as medical management? Of lupus, is it uh, is it an autoimmune disease that you treat the underlying condition, or w how you think about it? Well, it's usually thought of as an acquired hypercoagulable state rather than an autoimmune disease. In rare instances, if you have what's called um, catastrophic antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, you you need immunosuppression, but otherwise you need uh, anticoagulation if there are, are if there is a history of repeated uh, coagulation deficits. It n doesn't necessarily mean that this particular individual would need anticoagulation because moya moya can cause both infarcts and hemorrhages, so you have to be very cautious. Um, I just see that from Mayo Clinic Connect, the mom said he did very well with his first surgery, which great does, know. you know, that's great to know. It's also, it, it's very encouraging if, if, um, if he is stable from the surgery and doing well from the surgery, uh, I might give it a little time to develop some collaterals, maybe a month sure. or more, sure. and then consider if, depending on the anatomy and consultation when there are surgery, uh, whether to recommend continuing to improve the, the circulation through surgical means. You cannot reverse Moya Moya medically, so that's just not an option, but surgery has clearly has a role. I would be cautious about anticoagulation in this patient since he's done well with one surgery. Perhaps he needs additional... Well, um, especially around the time of the second surgery. Absolutely. It depends on anticoagulation. Absolutely. I think, I mean, I have done a, a good number of surgeries on similar patients, and the fact that you know, people have to be, or, or most of people are on aspirin, basically. Mm -hmm. Anything more than aspirin, anticoagulation, talking about Coumadin, you know, it increases your, the risk of bleeding uh, during surgery and after surgery. So for that short period of time, I tend to kind of minimize the need for those anticoagulation mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. use alternative measures to make sure the patient is hydrated very well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to minimize the risk. Once surgery uh, patients recover from surgery, you know, in a few weeks, I think it's safer to start anticoagulation. But we're glad that he did well after first surgery and the chances for the second surgery doing well probably will be very similar. Uh, and, you know, the tests here, I don't think, uh, you know, would have turned positive between the surgeries. So most likely he had it or he did not have it if it was not confirmed before surgery. So I think the surgical risk for both procedures would be very similar. So hopefully he'll do well for the next surgery. Um, the second uh, question uh, says, 
can it be diagnosed without or before having a stroke? Yeah, and I think this is this is the challenge, of course. Um, how do you how do you get uh, t to diagnose moya moya in the pre-symptomatic stage? So, uh, currently there are no guidelines regarding um, sort of what I would call blind screening. In other words, imaging uh, imaging without symptoms. Um, even even in uh, a family where one one person has a first degree relative with moya moya, if there is more than one uh, first degree relative with moya moya, then <coughs> then everyone in the family essentially should be screened with MRI in my in my opinion. Um, but other than that, what winds up happening mostly is that a lot of patients present. Um, for imaging, brain imaging, and get diagnosed with moya moya after presenting with uh, migraine-like headaches, um, and that's and that's something where where you may catch it well before the patient has a stroke. Uh, we have also a good number of patients that you know they get, uh, in particular, a patient with headaches. They get imaging, and you find the, the occlusive disease, and they're functioning at very high levels. And they're doing very well, and uh, they, those people do not have a stroke. So definitely, it is possible. Uh, it's important to uh, know about it and how to reduce the risk of stroke. For example, people who have this diagnosis, they should be very well hydrated. They should avoid smoking and additional injuries to their vessels. They should avoid. Uh, I hear you guys, uh, neurology colleagues. You know. How you think about all these, uh, now it's rare to find somebody who's drinking water that's, <laughs> you know, we see all these, uh, you know, I'm not going to name companies, energy but, drinks, but yeah. all these energy yeah. drinks and, w you know, they have bioactive substances, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, puffing, smoking, yeah. vaping, and so yeah. how you advise yeah. those people? Yeah. Well, I, I think the issue is that um, there are an enormous number of uh, clearly established modifiable risk factors for stroke. We talked about the classic ones, but um, and Dr. Tog is right. There are also non-classical ones, such as uh, stimulants, appetite uh, suppressants, or diet pills, etc., um, that uh, clearly can predispose uh, to stroke. Um, the issue of uh, supplements is a tricky one because they're rarely studied with the same care as uh, a pharmacologic agent, uh, but generally speaking, I would, I would avoid uh, supplements in this context. Great. So our last question is also from a Mayo Clinic Connect member. Is there a definitive evidence that long-term outcomes of direct is better than indirect? It makes sense that the direct graft gets better flow faster, but are the post-op risks worth it? Um, I like the question about evidence because um, I just wish we have thousands of patients where we, uh, you know, we can ask scientifically every question and answer it with, with numbers. Um, in my experience, I have done uh, both. I have tried to avoid the risk of direct in some patients, in particular people with a profession uh, that where speech is very important, singers, lawyers, you know. And, uh, you know, on the left hemisphere, you would think that you want to do sometimes minimum, especially if it's an asymptomatic side and the decision is to proceed mm -hmm. with surgery. Mm -hmm. So, but my experience for adults uh, and the general thinking is that a direct bypass is preferable in adult population. I had some patients who failed in direct bypass, and uh, I was not happy about it personally because you want to make sure you give it the best. So... My routine is direct plus indirect on every patient. And the indirect component, I use it from the dura, so I don't add any additional surgical risks by putting dura tissue. Um, and I have been surprised in the same patient using the same technique by the same surgeon on the same patient that one side, the direct component, is stronger at long term, and the other side is the indirect component is stronger. And that's how it was very hard for me to make a solid conclusion based on what I have seen. Evidence-based, I don't think we have the numbers from any single study to uh, show what uh, clear evidence, level one evidence. If we learn from colleagues in Japan, they have the highest experience because it's, it's, the disease is much more common. 
In Japan, the most common uh, technique is used is direct bypass, not indirect bypass. And uh, they don't take soft tissue, uh, you know, around the vessel. And, uh, you know, one would wonder who's better or, or is there anything done technically different. Uh, so I don't think the judge is out. And my, uh, my conclusion personally is do both for every patient and use the soft tissue that you can get around the vessel itself that soft tissue and indirect component and the dura, you don't add anything to the risk of procedure. And direct component is, uh, you know, anybody with good hand technical skills trained to do those bypass. Although it's becoming rare to find now a center who would accept uh, or who can efficiently take care of those patients because it's not only the surgical techniques, it's the anesthesia, uh, it's the recovery phase, it's the neurocritical care, uh, after the surgery and uh, and all what's around. So uh, I hope we answered this question clearly. So if we go over the slides one, uh, those uh, slides, you know, slide one does summarize the staging grade of Moya Moya. And even though it's divided in six stages, what we see from top left moving to the right and then uh, at the bottom left to right, we see the stages of the carotid artery. So if we look in the center, the carotid artery coming up, supplying brain vessels. Uh, next, stage two, uh, basically is when we start seeing the blockage in the carotid and the development of moya moya vessels. And this progress and progress until the phase where uh, the, the appearance of moya moya starts diminishing because, you know, the disease has burnt itself and, you know, the brain starts getting supplied from uh, many, many other vessels. Um, uh, the slide number two here, uh, what I like about it is that it definitely uh, explains what we see in the vessels. So the picture on the right side does show us the layers of the vessel wall. So what happens in Moya Moya, the internal elastic lamina, so these are layers inside the vessel walls, is fragmented. So that's a disease. That's not an inflammatory disease. There is no inflammation in the vessel walls. The internal elastic lamina, which is uh, this layer of uh, thin uh, pink that we see is fragmented and there is the position of fibrin in the vessel walls. So the vessel walls become thick, the media which is the muscle layer becomes thicker and thicker and it starts blocking the, the lumen. And the pink with a arrowhead inside with that we see is a clot because when there is limiting flow and, and the size of the vessel goes really narrow especially when people are not on aspirin or blood thinners, there's formation of clot and, you know, the vessel shuts down and that's when stroke happens. Um, um, going over the questions while waiting for others, if we look at slide three, uh, if you compare a... Uh, so, so these are operative uh, pictures. The one on the right side from a patient with Moya Moya, the one on the left from a patient with carotid occlusion, and both patients have similar symptoms of stroke. But the picture on the right, you see the brain surface uh, has lots of small vessels, and that's the hypervascularity in Moya Moya compared to, to patients with carotid occlusions. And the picture on the lower we see in dark and white is the endocyanine green, which is the fluorescein picture of that surface. So in Moya Moya, the PL surface or the surface of the brain has a very rich network of vessels, which is not the case uh, in carotid occlusion. Uh, so I don't know if there's any last point you want to make before the end, James, because we're nearing the end. <laughs> no, I think that's uh, fairly uh, straightforward and clear. Uh, that's all the time we have uh, today, but thank you for watching. Okay, thank you. Thank you for joining us today for this video Q&A. To find out more about future broadcasts, as well as share your experiences and find support from people like you, visit Mayo Clinic Connect at connect.mayoclinic.org. To request an appointment, visit mayoclinic.org.